Hello and welcome to the Hub on CGTN. I'm Meng Guan in Beijing. This year marked the 10th anniversary of China's Belt and Road Initiative. Now, so much talk has been focused on the graining of the BRI or BRI 2.0. How is that happening? The BRI International Grain Development Coalition or BRIGC convenes a meeting in Beijing recently to discuss just that. On the sidelines of the meeting, we caught up with Eric Soheim, the convener of the BRIGC and also the former Under Secretary General of the United Nations. We began our conversation with his recent trip to Shandong, my hometown. Eric, welcome back to China. It has been years. I came once during COVID and spent two weeks in quarantine with a beautiful view of Shanghai River. Uh, but of course, as most Chinese, I'm very happy that COVID is passed and that we can now go back and travel everywhere without any restrictions. It's so nice. You know, Eric, uh, recently you got quite famous because of videos of you taking a bullet train, of course, and then arriving at none other than my hometown, uh, Shandong, Zibo in particular, where the, the barbecue, the kebabs there uh, were so famous. What was it like? Uh, absolutely wonderful. I mean, very tasteful and so many young people. I mean, thousands upon thousands of young people coming to Cebu and we can have this very tasty fun, absolutely clean, very nice, uh, very, very tasteful and very nice. I can recommend everyone, please go to Cebu or make your own barbecue in very, whatever city. Um, Eric, let's talk about the session mm -hmm. that just happened, uh, the round table on the graining of the BRI. What are the latest uh, regarding the progress of the graining of the BRI? Uh, there is now enormous optimism, uh, particularly because when President Xi Jinping decided that China would stop all overseas coal investment, it had immediate impact. And coal investment, of course, came down, but also the desire from everyone to ask China, please come and help us with solar, with wind, high-speed rail, electric buses, all the alternative techno technologies. That desire is now so strong. So we see Belt and Road and this green Belt and Road coalition as a main vehicle to provide Chinese investment, Chinese technology, and also exchange of use between China and the world on the green developments. What are some of the success stories? I lived for some years in Kenya. If you travel through the city of Mombasa, mm -hmm. frankly, that's a quite poor and somewhat run-down city. So it's not really inspiring you traveling through the city. But then, wow, <laughs> you come to the Nairobi, Mombasa railroad, the rail station is completely green, everything is well functioning, it's completely clean, it's a completely new world, and of course it shows the people of Kenya the future uh, and how much Chinese investment can bring to Kenya. And this railroad is done with a lot of attention to nature that bypasses so that elephants and other uh, uh, animals can pass under or over uh, the railroad. In what ways do you envision and do you see the BRI in helping bring about or consolidating multilateralism? It should be a people's silk road, meaning that it's not, not just be government, not just be business, but also the exchange of ideas. Because while China today probably have more to teach the world uh, on environment than to learn, but still it should be a mutual exchange uh, of, of, uh, of uh, views. I mean, if China relates to Africa or to Latin America, there is a lot to learn uh, both ways. Say Brazil is a key, key nation. Uh, Brazil, is with, with, under President Lula, will now bring down deforestation in Brazil in a fantastic way. Indonesia has just brought deforestation to zero. Here there are lessons learned, which the rest of the world can benefit from. So the, the Silk Road or Belt and Road should not just be learning from Chinese experiences, but as much learning from, say, Indonesian or Brazilian or whatever nation's experiences. And do you think BRI is a concrete case in point uh, whereby uh, China is demonstrating to the world that uh, its global development initiative, for example, is not just a lofty slogan? No, no, Belt and Road is by far the biggest investment scheme in our era with enormous benefit from, men, from many developing countries. I mean, I mentioned a few, the Laos Railroad or the Mombasa Railroad in, in Africa and so, so, so many others. So yes, this is practicing the words of multilateralism in the 21st century. And the West should not criticize, the West should try to do better. Because what would African nations love to see? They want investment from China and from the United States or Europe. <laughs> they want people to people's contact to China and to the United States. And they want to send their bright young students, yes, to Tsinghua or 
<laughs> or to Peking University, but I also want to send them to Harvard uh, or, or Yale. So let's not see this as a competition between China and the West, but uh, as an area where we can have so much to cooperate about. Talking about that, do you think allegations uh, alleged against the BRI of it being uh, neocolonialism and debt trap is, um, by and large, far-fetched? That's basically anti-Chinese propaganda, which can com completely be dismissed. I can give you one example. I'm, I'm advisor to the president of, of Sri Lanka, Ranil Vikramasinghe, and he has now the enormous task of restoring his nation after the complete uh, melting down of the economy last year. And some has them finger pointed to China <laughs> for this collapse. But look, 8% of Sri Lankan debt is to China. There's also debt to India, but most of the debt is to the West. And now both, the, both President Xi of China, Prime Minister Modi of India, and the Western institution, they have all made an agreement with Sri Lanka to restructure the debt. So why, why finger point to China when there is more debt to the West? And overall, of course, developing nations have a lot more debt to the West than they do have to China. But the future, uh, the future leaning policy has to look into how we can jointly help these nations to restructure the debt and come out of, 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 of these difficulties. Eric, you have been serving as Norway's Minister of the Environment and International Development. And during your tenure, Norway spent 1% of its gross domestic uh, income as official development assistance, the highest in the world. Um, why did you decide to do that? We decided to do that because Norway is a very rich nation which can afford to help nations which have been more uh, unlucky in, in history. The one thing I was most proud of as Norwegian minister was to start the global campaign for the conservation of rainforests, the so-called Red Plus program. Uh, that we partnered with Brazil, with Indonesia, and with a number of other nations to bring down deforestation. And of course, Brazil and Indonesia did the job by their policies and their business, but we helped with, with, with Norwegian support for this. Um, it has been amazingly successful. Last year, Indonesia brought deforestation down to zero, not one. Uh, as Norway's uh, Minister of the International Development and Environment, also there was this Nature Diversity Act that has been enforced. Uh, some call it uh, Norway's most important piece of environmental legislation in the last 100 years. Um, tell us a bit about that. That is, in fact, quite similar to what in China is called the Red Line System. That's about how can you protect nature where it's really difficult. What is easy for Norway and pretty easy for China is to protect the nature up in the mountains where there are very few people are living. For China to protect some yeah. mountains in the Himalayas yeah. or some desert in Xinjiang may not be that challenging. What's very, very difficult is to protect nature in the Pearl River Delta or in the Yangtze Valley, which is an enormous population. Same we were facing in Norway, how to protect nature in our city and where people are living. So we made specific protection for, 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 for these areas. For example, if you want to make a new habitat or a new road, you are obliged to look into what impact it has on nature. When you do it, it should be done with utmost uh, attention to the ne potential negative impact on nature. Maybe you should put the road in another place if that's better for nature. Or if you cannot do that, make sure that, say, animals can pass the road without being, being destroyed by the road. All right. And you have said, and I quote, if we all come together and work together, there's no limit to what we can achieve on planet Earth. Um, some people would argue that uh, it sounds a bit uh, airy-fairy. What will be the priorities and how to go about achieving these goals that you've just stated? I don't think this is uh, airy-fairy. When 3,000 years ago, the old Indians said, the whole universe is one family. Uh, I think this is a deep insight. It was true 3,000 years ago, but it's true today also. Look to all major issues over time. If you want to create peace on the, in the world, well, it's much easier if the main powers say the United States and China work together. If you want to restart the economy after COVID, again, we can do a lot more together than separated want to prevent a new massive uh, pandemic, well, we need to prepare vaccines for that to happen. Uh, then we can do it much better together. What, uh, and of course, climate change and environment, we cannot solve these, these issues separately. So whatever is the issue, 
the two main powers of our era, China and the United States, should work more closely together. But they should work with the, let's call it, secondary powers like India, Europe, Brazil, South Africa, Turkey and others in a multipolar world where we all respect each other. And in my view, the most important word is the word respect. Because there is no way we will adopt each other's systems. I mean, China will not adopt the American system, but nor will America adopt the Chinese system. Exactly. Talking about China and the United States, it seems that uh, a vicious cycle is very easily kicked in. You know, one side accusing the other and tit for tat. But how about a, a virtuous cycle that many experts are calling on the United States and China uh, to building? Because after all, so much is at stake, as you said, only if China and the United, S United States can work together. How can the two sides really kick in or usher in a, a virtuous cycle to improve relations, in your opinion? Uh, we should reward all those people in politics or business or academics who call for a better understanding to try to understand each other, all those in the West to try to learn more about the enormous enormity of Chinese achievements, but also in China to understand, say, the United States better. When I hear my American friends bashing China, I tell them, but look, <laughs> these nations have brought more people out of poverty than any other nation uh, in history at a shorter time. And this nation, China, has a 10 times longer history than you have in the United States. Please look for the fantastic achievements of China. But if some of my Chinese friends are speaking negatively about uh, the United States, I tell them, look, this is the nation of George Washington or Abraham Lincoln. This is the nation that has been the leader of the scientific revolution in the world in the last decades. Look for the goods in America, not just for the bad. So let's avoid all the peacemakers rather than those who create tensions. Uh, finally, I want to get your take on the global economy. The IMF has uh, downcasted the, the forecast of global economic growth to less than 3%. Also, China's economy is growing, but uh, is under uh, tremendous stress uh, from many sectors and throughout uh, many industries. Uh, what's your you know, prediction and uh, forecast to the Chinese economy as well as the glo global economy going forward? What should be the new engines? Nearly all economic growth in the world this year is expected to come in Asia. China, India, Vietnam, Indonesia and a number of other nations. So this is really the growth engine of the world. The good news is of course that this is now more and more green growth. And <coughs> the, f the future growth will come in the green industries. And China and India has understood this better than anyone else. Look, China didn't have a traditional brand for cars. There is no Chinese Toyota. Toyota is known everywhere on planet Earth. People know Toyota. What did China do? Leapfrog into electric vehicles. And this year, BYD will be the biggest producer of electric vehicles in the entire world. That's smart industrial policy added. It's of course good for, for the environment. So these this smart, I will say, green economic policies of both President Xi of China, Prime Minister Modi of India, and many other Asian leaders, that's what will drive uh, the green shift, but it's also what will drive the economic growth of the, uh, uh, of the world in uh, the next decade.